Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. Uh, we're delighted that you could join us for a fun, I think, fast-paced conversation uh, about local issues. Uh, my panelists today, Cal Potter, former state senator, Tom Paneski, UW Sheboygan math professor, Ken Risto, simple social studies teacher. Me, I work for O'Neill Cannon Holman DeYoung, a very fine Milwaukee law firm. Just a simple now, lawyer. Now with offices in Sheboygan, and I am just a simple lawyer, but we've got lots of fun things to talk about here today. That was the short introduction. Just Yes, yes. that's good. Very ne abbreviated. Next oh. episode, it'll take 15 or 20 minutes. Um, there's actually a fair amount of local news. Um, I'm just going to start out with my favorite, the sidewalk cafe issue. Now, our city people are trying to uh, restrict the use of sidewalk cafes. Uh, the Sheboygan Press poll uh, actually said that 76% of the people who voted, myself included, voted against any restrictions, leaving a fairly small percentage. Professor? 76, what is that, 24? Very good, <laughs> excellent. Uh, only 24% of the populace really <laughs> interested in, uh, in restricting sidewalk cafes. To me, having sidewalk cafes in Sheboygan is just another sign that we're, Sheboygan is kind of going with the flow. Every city that you go into is filled with sidewalk cafes. I mean, it only lasts three or four months here. To me, it's a wonderful way to spend time. And uh, so it looks like it might be dead. Any other proponents of sidewalk cafes here? Not I. No? <laughs> it's a phony it's issue, I <laughs> It's a long, a well, long search of a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, it depends on what, what, what was the genesis of the need for this. Was somebody with a wheelchair who couldn't get through because the tables were blocking you know uh, too much of the sidewalk or somebody who came by with a with a baby buggy or something and couldn't get through I guess maybe you need to say at least so many feet need to be open for uh, pedestrian traffic but other than that I think you know well I've never we seen a need. cafe that's taken up the whole sidewalk I think the articulated reason there were a couple one was alcohol consumption okay. um, and so I think there may be some compromise to rope off areas but anything to me that encourages business downtown in particular, I think that's typically where we're looking at it. And there are a bunch of places downtown now where you can eat outside, and they're very pleasant. Uh, if, if you like to eat outside, apparently this group doesn't, but I do. Um, so I do think that the old, um, what we used to do on the school board, we'd come up with fabulous solutions to things, and then there would always be that pesky question, and what problem is it that we're trying to solve? <laughs> well, yeah. well, who owns the sidewalk? The city. The city owns the sidewalk. City can so, regulate. So they can regulate the use. But who pays for sidewalk repair? Businesses do. Businesses. So Thank you, Professor. <laughs> there's kind of a little conflict there, nice, right? Nice arrangement. Yeah. Well, I just can't get a rise out of anybody on that issue, so yeah, we're going to uh, move on. It's a, it's, it's, it's a silly. It's silly. I mean, has there been a serious problem with people grabbing beers and wandering off in the middle of the street and creating public havoc? Not to my knowledge. I haven't seen any arrests for that reason. Yeah. In I Madison, mean, you might have a problem. Yeah. Kids running around <clears throat> drinking beers. Yeah. I mean, go to a football game. You know, I've, I've sat in those, the tables over at Urbane, and I can't recall any teenager coming up and saying, hey, could you slip me a quick beer as I'm walking by? Yeah. No. I just don't understand the need yeah. of all the things the city needs to, to confront and deal with or address. I just don't think at this, this particular time we really need this kind of legislation. Well, good. Not and, needed. You know, it, our city alder people are part-time, just like our legislators are supposed to be part-time. My theory is that the less they're in the in the buildings where they govern, the less mischief that goes on. <laughs> if well, you, I don't know if that's true with the state budget now. They're not the buildings. <laughs> <laughs> like a true liberal. Yeah, yeah, the less, the better. I'm a small, this sounds like a creepy conservatism coming into your philosophy. It is. It is. It is. It must is. be your age. Just or she's the, had a birthday. You know, it's, <laughs> it's the topic, alcohol. That's what it is. We draw the line me. when it comes to laws here. Who here does not have gray hair? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm just going to move on. But in any event, um, the, on a slightly more we important can talk about note, here, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. this is a very tough crowd here today, and, and so crowd control is going to be difficult. Maybe if I could just rope you guys in like the city <laughs> wants to rope in the, uh, the uh, sidewalk cafes, it would be fine. Um, I think in a very important piece of business, city council uh, has recently uh, agreed to an early retirement package for up to, I think it said, uh, between 20 and 22 employees uh, per year, allowing uh, 
$1,300 per year severance package, uh, which Jim Gisha, uh, who I think was one of the older people primarily behind this, said would typically pan out at about $35,000 a year. He expects that might save up to a million dollars a year. Good idea, bad idea? It's worked for the district. The Sheboygan Area School District has had some early retirement uh, program in place uh, to, encourage, to encourage people to end their careers early. <laughs> um, and, it's, and, and it really does save a substantial amount of money uh, because typically those people on top of the salary schedules um, are making something like seventy four or seventy thousand dollars a year and you're hiring at say thirty two or what you know that's about a forty thousand uh, dollar difference and, and and it allows uh, the district to really continue to fund uh, other kinds of benefits without really to come turn to the taxpayers for for more and more and more and more money is there anything like that out. at the state level um, in the university system not that I'm aware of yeah you know, part you know, of the problem that we you can go on and on and on for that matter yeah. that, well there you go and I think you can at the city oh absolutely uh, uh, and teaching you know, as well. some good because some good souls like uh, Lucy Dalavalli taught well into her, her 60s mm -hmm. put in 40 years of service mm -hmm. uh, so there is no mandatory retirement age for for us either yeah that's whatever you can <laughs> whatever yeah. your soul can stand yep. um, the flip side of that, though, is, and I know the school district has a very expensive health insurance package for retirees. If you're in the school district for a certain period of time, there are certain benefits that you get yep. um, up to Medicare time, if I am Correct. not mistaken. And so uh, those benefits, those retiree benefits, I think, can be, can be pretty expensive. The article I read in the newspaper really did not speak to retirement benefits for for employees who would take this early retirement package. So um, I'm going to presume the million dollar savings does take into account any extended benefits that people would have. But um, I, think, uh, I think it's a good idea. Well, along with that, they even said, I think the paper article said uh, they have an opportunity to reorganize a department if people leave. Exactly. And that's where I wanted to kind of lead the conversation at this point. Getting back to my idea, which is, why not take a look at how you do business and how you structure your department and so forth? I think that's difficult to do unless you have retirements. I know Sharon Winkle had a number of retirements at the library hmm, two years ago and did a massive reorganization of the library, saving, I think, considerable money. And, uh, but it really required that retirement um, flexibility, I guess you'd say, in order to do that. So, so I. I hope it happens. I think it's a great time. Were there some proposals to reorganize the, the organizational boxes while you were on the council? Because I ran into Carl Tapel, and I don't know if Carl was, when he was an alderman, whether you were in that, was that during the time you were an uh, alder I, person? No, I wasn't on the council. Because Carl had all sorts of ideas, too, that he shared with me at the Y one day of saving money on a municipal level by really organizing boxes and consolidating offices, responsibilities, and so on. Yeah, he he must have been. In, uh, he wasn't on the council. I was. Uh, he was the seventh district, and I think that was when I was there. It was Arbke and Leonard. Okay. So and then I don't recall okay. Carl coming when okay. Carl came in. Well, any imagination that you can bring into um, the public sector that is really required in the private sector on a regular basis, I think, is a good thing. In that same vein, it's my understanding that the city council is looking at new health insurance. Um, packages for city employees, both of which have some pretty stunning savings. Two million dollars a year if city employees are, what's, it's not channeled, what is the word? I know we talked about it in the school district, but are directed uh, to just preferred, one. Preferred provider. Uh, yeah, to, to one health care provider. 1.5 million if they go, if they're still allowed to do the Aurora split or St. Nick's. I know it's very tough whenever you change insurance and people lose their doctors, they have those personal relationships and I think it's hard to say, well, we're going to save $500,000 a year and you've got to give up your doctor, but from a city perspective, from the taxpayer's perspective, it makes sense. That's right. The state yeah. has, has provided incentives for uh, uh, low cost plans if you do you know, state level. If you choose the one that's uh, least expensive, the state will pick up the cost. And if you choose one of a myriad of other ones, you 
pay the difference. Right, steerage. That's what it's called. Steerage. I, yeah. I knew it. People I think we are call it, we call it a preferred. That, we call it a preferred with, provider. How does that work with union contracts? Yeah. Well, it's negotiated with with the the provider is negotiated. The, the, go, the provider is negotiated, correct? Or the fee that they have to pay to. Well, well and both. I think and I think or this both. may. Yeah, yes. I think this may be an issue for the city as they're looking at these ways of saving really substantial amounts of money. I mean, really large part, you know, large buckets of money and how that will interact with, with union negotiations if they're reopener clauses and, and such. But uh, yep. it seems to me to make sense just, uh, again, looking at more efficient ways of doing business. And the problem you get with health insurance is when I was on the school board, uh, Roger Lies, the, the current finance director, did a fabulous job of looking at different ways of, you know, through steerage and whatever, getting mm -hmm. people to take cheaper plans and so forth, save the district a, a bundle of money. But at a certain point, it's as lean and as efficient mm -hmm. as you can get, and there's really no other way you know, other place to go with it. But I know Susan Hart, the mayor's um, administrative officer, I always get that title wrong too, um, has been really instrumental in looking at some of these health care savings. And so I think hats off to her and the council and, and hopefully the, um, the unions will. Well, it's kind of it just put a little interesting twist on the story here is that in April we had some new aldermen elected, the business aldermen, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so they, they snap up the ambulance mm -hmm. service and now they're, and it's only April through October, just beginning of October, it's not very long. Reorganizing the health care packages, uh, early retirement, uh, and, and the new aldermen are involved in it, Gisha and Mark Hanna. And so the, the business kind of aspect or approach to things. And then we get, you know, the health, the human relations uh, director says, ah, it's time to retire. The financial director says, ah, it's time to retire. <laughs> And of course, Tom Holton had moved on uh, year, last year to a better, you know, a better job. So, so as this activity is going on, it seemed like maybe the uh, the finance people and the human relations people thought, "I'm near age 65. I don't want to start a whole new project and rearrange. And maybe it's best to retire." I mean, I'm just supposing, mm -hmm. and let get a new person so they could uh, do the work and uh, and, and create the the savings and stuff, because you got some active uh, aldermen. You have some very active aldermen. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, the, the, I don't know if I would call it the stars are being in alignment, but you've got um, a mayor who's pretty adamant about keeping taxes where they are. Yep. You've got certain costs that are reality. Yep. And so if, you know, not speaking for the union leadership by any means, but if you face that reality, you really start looking at trying to save on benefits or you talk about members, you know, not working. I mean, we face in a sort of a same way in the district, the school district side, the same thing. We have a 3.8% increase. We're allowed under the caps. Do you want that money going into ever increasing health care benefits or do you want to actually increase salaries and those salary schedules to keep up, try to keep up with inflation? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of incentive on the part of both parties to find better ways of of providing health care coverage to your folks. I mean, the district, for example, we made one change which saved uh, uh, everybody win-win. Uh, we had members who had the option under the old health care package to show up in an emergency room 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and people would bypass the clinics and go right to the emergency room because you'd get faster treatment. We simply made the rule that you unless it was a life-threatening situation and you needed an emergency room, if there was a clinic open, you had to go there. If you didn't, you paid the emergency room procedures and it was amazing how people's behavior changed. Their, behavior changed. changed. Their behavior real quick. Exactly. <laughs> and the same with in the old days, the old package really didn't have any prescription deductibles. Uh, so there was no incentive to try generic drugs as opposed to the, the name brands. Right. And then we changed the, the incentive program, and lo and behold, people do respond to incentives after all. It's like the economists tell us they do. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, if, if you get the bill and you find out the extraordinary yeah. charge for the MRI or the CAT scan, uh, and then you, you get into this, what has always seemed to me an unseemly advertising campaign about, you know, we... And they never say we can do it cheaper, but we're more experienced or whatever. Um, but it's, again, to the extent that you can build in economic power on people's parts to make decisions, 
and save money, it, it, seems to, it seems to make some sense. But going back to, I mean, the, the, the city is going to get a new public works director. Bill Bittner, Bittner, Bittner. I think, has just started. Uh, seems like a nice guy. Uh, we have a new city assessor, Marie Ellis, had retired. We have, um, uh, we'll, I think, fairly soon have a new finance director. Some really excellent candidates came forward in this second round of interviews. Um, and then with Ed Sirk retiring, I assume they'll be in search for an HR director. I think your point it may be well taken that people are really beginning to see that the city government is changing. Um, the mayor on his own can't really do it. Uh, but if the mayor has a good council that is working and you, and you just, there's, there are some changes of In Russia, so it just yeah. kind of moves the, it started a movement. I guess, but here's bit. my thought is that any executive coming in, typically, even the minister at your church, typically is going to bring, in not too much time, there'll be a turnover on just that second layer because you bring in your own people and so forth. So I think this is kind of a natural process as well as just, but to follow up on that, the Bittner, is that the new mm -hmm. the gentleman coming in? He's from, uh, is it Rockford? Yes. And they got a new mayor. Uh -huh. And he says the mayor was looking to get a new public works director. Okay. And so he, because he had been there for a while, and, uh, and it wasn't him. <laughs> right. Well, they, so it was time for him to move, and now he's moving to Sheboygan, and, he's, and he likes, likes Wisconsin. Yeah. And taking a fairly substantial pay cut. Yes. But uh, in any event, uh, it, people just may not know that our department heads, I think unlike really any other unit of government in this area, have five-year contracts or terms of service. They can only be terminated for cause with, I think, three-quarters of a vote of the city council. So really, unless people retire, your chances of, of removing people from office like you see in a regular city kind of situation just doesn't exist here. So... Um, I remember Renee Susha being very surprised because she was very upset about Sharon Winkle's attempt to get a five-year contract. Oh, right. And the city attorney at one meeting pointed out to her that all department heads <laughs> have <laughs> what, what Sharon Winkle was trying to get, you know, in a, in a more private organization through her board. And the, uh, Alderman Susha was stunned, and I think a number of council people were. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's real job security, let's put it that way, and um, even better than the school districts. So. Yeah, we have uh, administrative you know, building principals and so on across the district have two-year contracts. Two-year contracts. And I don't think the superintendent uh, can have more than a two-year contract right. with, with perhaps... It's a rolling contract. A rolling contract. You can continue to look at it, but you can't extend it out more than, than two years formally. I think so. for your department heads, having a contract is a smart idea. Sure. Yeah. I mean, These having are difficult jobs. I right. Mean, if, yeah. you're, if you have a bad snowstorm and the streets aren't plowed, plowed yeah. properly, it's easy for a council person to say, "Let's get rid of this bum." And you know, the emotion of the day, or some, or the library director, for example, somebody doesn't like a book on the shelf, or so. You know, the emotion of the time can sometimes yeah. take a toll that I think these contracts <clears throat> protect against it and let people calm down before they I really agree. make a decision. I well, that structure was put in place, you know, years and years and years ago because they didn't want to have a strong mayor. I mean, Sheboygan's uh, municipal constitution, for lack of a better word, was really set up to make for a, a weak mayor form of government. So mayors couldn't just come in and it was bring part, everybody it was in. Mayor. That was a part-time part -time mayor. That was a part-time mayor. Now it's full-time mayor. Yeah, that was kind of a trend in Wisconsin at the turn of the turn of the 20th century that they were looking at the big mayors and the corrupt mayors of Tammany Hall and. And they wanted to have a mayor. There was suspicion about a strong mayor and more of a preference to hiring competent people to stay in positions no matter who happened to be mayor and who didn't. You know, and, and so I think there's a suspicion in Sheboygan that strong office when in fact it really isn't as, uh, as strong as people really think it is. Although stronger than it would be if we had a city administrator. But oh, yes, right. But let's Absolutely. move on. Which is another I, pattern. Oh, I yes. just wanted to comment yes. on that you mentioned right at the beginning, leaf. Uh, leaf removal. Leaf removal. We're on Thursday Appa now. <laughs> but, but apparently, yeah, we're on Friday. <laughs> but apparently it was just uh, at random before, and now they're zoning off the city. It was uh, into five zones for five different days mm -hmm. and uh, more efficiently uh, collect the leaves. And I, I think, okay, there's enough. Yeah. 
yeah. Things are moving forward here in See, the city. See, we got garbage yeah. pickup on the north side on Monday and leaf pick up, and leaf pickup on Monday on the south side, south of Union. So they don't overlap. They don't bump into each other. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> they know how to do it. Think of next. What are they think of next? <laughs> well, moving right along. I like being a member of this club. <laughs> <laughs> this works out pretty well. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted uh, Ken to talk a little bit about, uh, there have been the usual headlines about um, Sheboygan students and test scores and so forth, and just a connection between the local and national uh, side of, of, of the political world. Um, it's been called uh, no, Leave No Child Untested, um, but um, is more formally known That's as the- That's what George Bush calls it. Uh, Leave No Child Behind. <laughs> Marion Wright Edelman, who coined that phrase, the head of the Children's Defense Fund, as I understand, is very angry that this law bears that name, which was so contrary to her thoughts. But in any event, that's more than you want to know about the title. Leave No Child Behind is up for uh, reauthorization at the federal level. It passed overwhelmingly way back when. Of course, was not funded as it had been promised. Um, has held the, has made our children better test takers, true or false? Um, made them more accountable? <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? Well, it's no child left behind. Uh, it's, and the reason I mention that is because when educators get on cameras like this or they talk among themselves, we use that acronym NCLB. And technically speaking, it's really the, the law, it's not, it, that's not even the name of the legislation. It's the, it's a reauthorization of the Secondary elementary elementary Act. Yeah, what was it, Carl? Elementary and Secondary Act. Yeah, Elementary and Secondary Act. So it's uh, el elementary and secondary e ESA or something along right. those lines. Um, and my talking points uh, that I got the other day from my union was to make, oh, I never call it No Child Left Behind, call it, you know. Uh, Isa. Call it leave it. But that leave no said, child. I, I think uh, you know. I think the. I think most people would would probably agree that um, the law probably had good intentions, and it certainly focused in on uh, making schools accountable. Uh, it was certainly focused in on saying that we couldn't look at just the average performance of schools. We need to look at every subgroup of students, including kids with special needs. I think certainly in the district, it's really focused us on those subgroups made us more attentive uh, to their needs. Um, and I think it also really has focused on really paying attention to reading, writing, arithmetic, the three R's, and now science is coming online. Um, that being said, the law, like lots of laws, has all sorts of odd little, I would think, pernicious kinds of spinoffs. What's happening across the country, and it's starting to happen, sadly, in the Sheboygan Area School District is, um, you know, some buildings have talked about, in Sheboygan even, uh, getting rid of recess. I know Washington Elementary was playing around with, with doing that. I don't know if they ended up doing that at all. Um, we know that social studies instruction, uh, where I'm responsible, has declined in the elementary schools. Um, and now there's talk in, in the middle schools of providing more, more time for um, focusing in on those areas at the expense of music and art and um, phi ed and, and even social studies instruction. Because social studies is tested on the state level, but there's no penalties or sanctions if you don't do well. Federal. Yeah, it's the federal law, and there's no social studies component to the federal law. Um, and I think the other law, the other the challenge the law faces is, is that when you talk about 100%, that may be great political rhetoric, and it certainly is nobody wants their child left behind, certainly. I know I wouldn't want my child left behind. Uh, but the reality is, is even eventually in this system, a school that's even high performing because of socioeconomic status like Kohler will be a school at risk, because all you need is one or two kids just to have a bad day at school, or just one kid who, just decides to pencil in because what I think what the taxpayers don't understand is there's no penalty for the student to do badly on this test. There's no penalty at all in almost all school districts. Nobody's not going to be, nobody is going to be uh, held back or punished in any way. And so we do have students in the district who come in and say, I don't want to be here. You can't make me do well, you know, and they just kind of go through the motions. And you've got some of that going on. Um, and then the other challenges, of course, is uh, finally, as I think you've got a real challenge when in a district like Sheboygan where we have kids who literally have just come out of 
uh, countries where they don't speak English and they are now at the moment, this should change, but at the moment they're given the same test as every other kid. And yes, you can make some adoptions, you can kind of help them with some parts, but when you get to the reading test, they have to do that test by themselves. And so in the Sheboygan Area School District has 10% of their students are called ELL, English Language Learners Levels 1 and 2, which means that they just have a very, very, very simple command of English. And not too surprisingly, a lot of them did not do uh, well in that test. So it's, it's a law that really needs to be, in my view, revised and rethought and con reconsidered. That won't happen this year. Presidential politics are going to get in the way of all that. I think Congress will kick that can down the road and see who the next person is in the White House. Yeah, I, it seems to me that, uh, well, I'm interested in your views on the role of, besides just giving money, the role of the federal government in local education decisions, um, accountability, in seems to me if you have a law like leave no child behind, no child left behind. There you go. Uh, thank you. I got it. Um, you should fund it well, we and, uh, and, not, and not use it as some sort of bully pulpit for castigating school districts and teachers and, and so forth. I mean, put your money where your mouth is. Well, and the other wrinkle that I don't think many people understand about the law is if you're going to have the national government come in with a national testing system, then you really should have, then you may as well be in for the whole, the whole pinata, right? You should have a national set of standards and a national set of, of, uh, of criteria. Right now, every state, can, every state can decide their own level of, their own level of competency. And so Arkansas can claim that 98% of their kids can read. And Wisconsin is claiming 70. Well, is Arkansas ahead of, of Wisconsin? No, the bar is just set lower. So under the prevailing law, every state is given the opportunity to find competency any old way they want to. And Wisconsin, to their credit, hasn't really lowered the bar or changed the bar. They did a little bit in math and science after the first couple of years of testing. Um, but they haven't, compared to other states, really uh, lowered the bar so that every kid can jump over it. Well, we have just a minute left. You were an educator, a legislator. What, what role, if any, should the federal government to have, do you think? Well, I think they should guarantee opportunities. They should guarantee service levels. But they should be very careful on defining what performance is when it isn't, uh, for example, Wisconsin leads the nation, has for many years, and kids doing well on national standardized testing, whether it's SAT or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, Wisconsin's, I think, proven that what they have developed as a state function, which education is, uh, has done a good job. Um, I don't think that the federal government should be so prescriptive to force Wisconsin to start dismantling what they found is successful to teach to the test and do things which then, indeed, start watering down what the end result is. And, and we uh, have to wind it up at that point, but uh, great discussion. Uh, thank you for joining us.